Hey there, YouTubers. I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. Today's web DM is going to be walking you through making a character in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Jim Davis, are you excited? Oh yeah, I'm excited. I mean, we're going to go through and make a character together and uh, walk through that first chapter of the PHB. And uh, afterwards, you're going to be ready to play your first session. Yeah, so let's get to it. Let's talk about creating your PC, creating your player character. The vacuum packing has been freshly cracked yeah. on these role players. Yes, uh, they still have that new book smell. Mm, before they've suffered their first TPK, the humiliation oh. of a night full of ones that they've rolled. Oh my God. Uh, picking the wrong spell. Yeah. All of those things that turn gamers into jaded, cynical, yeah. uh, that, we, that we become in our old age. Exactly, um, they haven't thrown dice yet. Like they haven't thrown, thrown them across. Yet. They the haven't room. wept at the loss of a character. Yeah. They haven't been so angry with a DM that they wanted to just burn up. Right. Uh, but they will, and they're going to do so after they've made their first character. You'll get there. So, creating your character. Let's start with inspiration. So, inspiration is where uh, is where I start. I think you start. Oh yeah. Uh, and and in an earlier show of ours, in fact, one of our first shows ever, we kind of visited this topic and basically broke it down into two broad categories, inspiration that comes from some kind of mechanical effect that you build a character around, or inspiration from a kind of archetype or a concept yeah. that sticks in your mind. I am almost exclusively in the inspiration from an archetype or a concept camp. Most mm -hmm. of the time, the mechanics of the game, either I'm ambivalent about them or bored by them, yeah. uh, and so I want to have some kind of a concept. However, I do want that concept, once I've thought about it, to be mechanically viable and, and to, to, you know, to have game mechanics back up my concept. Exactly. Um, well, 5th edition has, has enough uh, options that it doesn't matter how, you're going to be able to fit your concepts somehow, somehow into the system. Right. It's really difficult to come up with a concept that isn't in some way mechanically viable. So that it, it, you know, if you are a new role player and maybe you've done some reading online or you've talked to some of the veteran players and they talk about characters that are suboptimal or subpar, I mean, that's way less of a concern in 5th edition, and yeah. you, you, you shouldn't feel the need to like follow a class guide or follow a, a strict set of rules when mm -hmm. making your character. You should feel comfortable exploring your options, seeing what's going on, because as long as you show up and, and have a willingness to play and, and to get feedback from your, from your table mates, mm -hmm. you know, that's what's going to be more important than what class you chose. And, you know, that what kind race. of thing. Right. Your new player has, they've picked their concept. They've picked their concept, yeah. That, you know, and, and you know, what, for whatever it's from, uh, comics, TVs, movies, yeah. video games, you know, stories you've heard. Now it's time to start picking stats. Yeah. And, and things to fit that concept and make that character go from your head uh, so that you're ready to play. Yeah, and there's a, there's a couple of ways that you can generate those stats. Right. You can either roll. You roll. Or you can do point by. Right, correct. Uh, there's also the standard array. And by the way, we do have a show on roll or point by. Yes, so we you do can have check a show. that out. <laughs> and so it's worth saying that the standard array is also just, these are the same stats you would get using the point by. It's just sort of like pick these standard stats for you so right. that you don't have to go through the hassle of, of figuring out the math of it. We've almost always preferred to roll. Uh, I think like the suspense of it, like the fact that characters can be wildly inconsistent or that mm -hmm. you can manage to get a character that's like really good at something but also run the risk of getting one that's like really bad at something. Yeah. Those kinds of decisions are usually made by your DM. Before you start making your character, just ask your DM, hey, what kind of method are we using to generate stats? Um, every DM's different. Even if they're using point by, they might be using a different total number of points that you yeah. have or have a different array for standard array or have different rules for rolling stats. Just check with your DM before uh, you start uh, start down that path character creation. Okay, so just say we rolled. We rolled, and, and for us, that's gonna be what? 46 drop the lowest, and we're gonna generate, for our, in our house rule, we generate seven stats and then drop the lowest one of those stats. Yeah. This does tend to generate higher stats than you would get with point by, but mm -hmm. that's how we roll. Yeah, um, sometimes. I know some people are gonna be like, oh, it doesn't always. <laughs> it doesn't always. But I generally, you know, I don't know. I always I always have higher stats. Uh, I, I uh, usually, yeah, usually. I also use the tiny get. dice. Yeah, and they, have, they are magic. Un, your, the, the magic that Pruitt's referring to is the fact that they're unbalanced. They're probably <laughs> unbalanced. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put them in. I'm not gonna lie with those tiny, minuscule dice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
but still, it's tradition. That's one way to do it. The player's handbook has a different order for how you sort of generate a character. And if you're following along or looking in chapter one of the player's handbook, sort of recommends going with race and class and then generating abilities. But for us, coming up with the concept is what we're doing when we're thinking of sort of race and class. And then afterwards, we yeah. actually go and pick the, the pick yeah. class. This yeah. is sort of the way we do it. Yeah, because in, in my mind, it's a little more malleable. Like you just come up with a general concept, you get your stats, okay, cool. Well now, well, you know what? I will pick this race instead of that. Because right. you know maybe the concept is a human, but you want to do a dragonborn. Yeah, after you, you roll your stats. You yeah. kind of, the way that character creation is laid out in the player's handbook makes it seem like character creation is this rigid, step-by-step -step process and where for me I kind of just I, I it, it's an all-at-once thing yeah uh, I have some stats and I'm constantly thinking what class what race what background uh, and and then as one portion of that becomes sol solidified I, mm -hmm. I then build the rest of the character around that right um, sometimes I start with a background <laughs> even uh, before anything else you know at first level your race is going to give you a couple of ability score bumps correct yep. and it's going to give you a few abilities whether mm -hmm. it's uh, dark vision give you an extra skill here and there right. maybe access to a feat if you're a variant right. human right. Um, but you know look through and find what you want thing is is background also gives you a couple of skills yeah. set skills set skills um, and an extra ability that's like you know just right. a little something extra right but the class uh, is going to give you an option for skills. So right. that's why I always find picking race and background first, because mm -hmm. that's the set things. And right. then the variable, the, the options in character creation usually be. find in the re in the class. Right. I think that's a good way to do it, because you do have those, uh, I mean, I think there are a handful of, of backgrounds that do give you an option and what skills you take, but most of them just offer two skills. Uh, in addition to some of the other minor abilities that they, they offer. When thinking about race, you know, you've got your the base, sort of the base of it, and then a sub-race that you have, those give you different abilities. And, you know, you can make a character that synergizes your your choice in race and class and background completely. This, the example of this would be like the dwarven fighter soldier. Yeah. You know, then all of the, the, the background, the class, and the race sort of fit this cohesive archetype, and that's one way of doing it. Or mm -hmm. you can, any one of these areas, race, class, and background, you can change up to be something different yeah. if you're if you're in the mood for it. So a human fighter who's a sage is has a different sort of uh, background as opposed to say soldier. Right. Um, even though the fact that the thing that they're really drawing their strength from the class of fighter is is really sort of the more important choice. Mm -hmm. uh, these others are. Uh, they really change the flavor of the character. But yeah, it gives you knowledge to, to, to that all things arcane. You know, right. I mean, it's going to set you up for a completely different skill set. When choosing race, you have a lot of different options. Yeah. And not, I mean, I'm not just talking about like whether I'm a dwarf or a, or a human or an elf. I'm talking about like you have a lot of different ways to approach it in that you can try to make those mechanically optimized choices if that's what you're into, but you don't have to. And it's really difficult. We've, I, we've played at the table with, you know, tiefling fighters and you know dwarven wizards and and, mm -hmm. and types of characters that are not necessarily always with the class and the race mechanically optimized yeah. and if you're a new player you might read online about mechanical optimization it's a method of play a mode of play that you can engage in but it's by no means the only one right um, you play so. the character <laughs> However you want. However you want to. Let's pick a race, Jim Davis. Okay, so I'm thinking of, I've, I've had a character concept in my head for a while uh -huh. of a kind of rustic wizard. Okay. Gets his hands dirty, uh, travels the backcountry roads, um, and immediately I'm thinking in my mind, okay, they're probably human, maybe halfling. And as I sort of like look through the, the, the section on humans and halflings, I ultimately am going to settle on halfling. Yeah. Uh, I love the movie Willow as a kid. I don't know if anybody else remembers that movie or if they've never seen it. If you've never seen it, my God. You've got to see this movie. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. So I love it. And the main character, uh, Warwick Davis, is a is a Nelwyn wizard. And and you know, in my mind, it's like, okay, halfling wizard. I, I want something like that. And now I have a choice, right? I've got the uh, what is it, Lightfoot and Stoutheart. Yeah. Uh, the two halfling sub races, and I can go. Okay, Stoutheart is the mech mechanically optimized choice. Get a bonus to con, or uh, and, and then the uh, resistance to poison. But there's just something about it that doesn't speak to me. So I'm ultimately probably gonna pick like Lightfoot, get yeah. the bonus to dexterity and the ability to hide and uh, light obscurement. Now I'm making that decision, but I'm making that decision while at the same time I'm seeing what sort of 
uh, background I'm choosing. I'd probably make something maybe like folk hero, something like that, yeah. or uh, maybe even Outlander to represent the fact that he's you know good in the wild and yeah. kind of a hermit lives out. Maybe even hermit uh, or, would yeah, be hermit. one that I would take yeah. as well. Um, so those are three. And as I'm as I'm sort of like thinking of my think, you know narrowing down my choices in background, that's when I'm going to go over and visit the class page, visit the wizard see what the specifics of their class features are, and, and look and see. I'm definitely looking to get the most out of my skill selection as possible. Right. Uh, that's the one area where I will always try to optimize mm -hmm. uh, just because of the way skills work in, uh, in fifth edition. Yeah. But you don't have to. Um, yeah. But when they go over to that class section, they're gonna see a few things. Right, they're gonna, they're gonna see They're gonna see proficiencies. Uh-huh. And it's gonna tell you like armor, weapons, Right. That you're proficient in. That you're proficient um, in. Um, and then your saving throws. Mm -hmm. And then your skills. Correct. So those are all the, the different uh, the different areas of the game that you're going to add that proficiency bonus in. Your proficiency bonus is contingent upon your total character level. Um, for most people, their character level and, and the class that they have are going to be one and the same. I am a you know fifth level wizard. Uh, you know, but there are some people who might be a third level wizard, second level fighter, but their overall class is yeah. going to be. That's sort of a, a holdover from earlier editions, the way we talk about it. Um, but yeah, your proficiency bonus is based on your class level or your character level, and it adds to all of these things, the mm -hmm. your saving throws, your skills, one of the main stats that drives character. The other things you're going to see are hit points yeah. and your hit dice. Um, hit points, you'll <laughs> you might find that people argue endlessly about what hit points mean. Yeah. Whether it's moxie, grit, fighting spirit, physical toughness, um, morale, whatever. Uh, hit points are, are a, a where Dungeons and Dragons combat gets really abstract. Mm -hmm. and, and you can, you know, a swing of a sword just takes off a bit of this number and, you know, did I get hit? Is this a deep cut? Is this a mortal wound? Is this a light scratch? Those are all the elements of, D of Dungeons and Dragons combat that really come down to just how you narrate the thing. Yeah. Uh, and your hit points are just, I like to think of them as just, this is my fight number. This yeah. is as long, I can stay in the fight as long as this number isn't zero. Mm -hmm. And different things are going to lower that number, most often damage, um, in fact, almost exclusively damage if you're playing by the base rules. Um, but then your hit dice are something that's related to hit points, but uh, there are things that you spend during a short or long rest in order to get some hit points back. Yeah. And, and so that's why you should keep track of your hit dice, make a note of them. Um, you're gonna get maximum hit points at your first level, um, but after that, you might roll for hit points. If I'm using a smaller hit die, like say a D6 or a D8, I'm probably just gonna take the average. Yeah, it's gonna be a little better. It's gonna be a little better, but if I've got like a, a D10 or a D12 hit die, then I'm gonna take the chance and roll for it to, to see if I can't get that, uh, that 10 or that 12 on there. And then you get the rest of your class features. Some yeah. classes get a lot of stuff at first level, some classes just get a little bit, but you're always gonna make a choice about skills. Mm -hmm. This is where your race and your background are gonna be, for me, most relevant. Right. Um, this is a moment where you, you're, gonna, you're taking that character concept that you had. For me, it's Rustic Wizard. I'm looking at, uh, at, at the wizard list, and I like Diviner for this halfling. I like it for a very particular mechanical reason. So I've, okay. com I've combined the concept, I'm combining both methods in this example, in that I want a character who will one day take the lucky feat. Uh, and because halflings can reroll ones uh, mm -hmm. on, a, on a, a saving throw or ability check, and diviners get a special ability that lets them pre-roll two dice and substitute those for another roll, uh, and the lucky feat lets me re-roll dice, I want a character that can just mess with the d20 yeah um and and is uh, just a, a more survives by luck and and being in the right place at the right time and i see those three elements the halfling lucky diviner as uh central to this class so this is a class concept that's not going to come online for me until fourth level and i'm having to sacrifice a uh, an ability score increase that i would be getting at fourth level for a feat mm -hmm. that while it's a very strong feat does put me a bit behind in terms of keeping my intelligence. Now, I don't care about that kind of stuff. I'm gonna sink as many points into intelligence later on um, as I can, and it's more important to me to have uh, the concept be complete as early as possible. Right. So sometimes you're just not gonna get, the concept that you have might take several levels to become a, char a solid character concept. And sometimes that might be like, 12th or 13th level, but I would, I would caution against 
aiming for those kinds of concepts when you're first starting to play, just because you know you should enjoy the first few levels of the game. To me, they're some of the best D and D because um, I get some nail biter combats. <laughs> well, you're, you're <laughs> probably going to have some close calls. Probably going to have some close calls. Combat is is more dangerous at lower levels because it, it you're you're that close. I mean, one cr one critical hit, a, a crit, right, and that could be it. Particularly at first level, where you just have one hit die to spend on a short rest, and you've just got the first level hit points plus your con modifier. Plus your combat fire, uh, and so it can be deadly, uh, yeah. and even up to like third level, uh, you're you know you're in Dungeons and Dragons where death is is close at hand. Now some people like playing in that mode all through the through the game, and some people are glad to get out of the deadly lower levels and to get a character that can survive a couple of hits, that can last a couple of battles without needing to have a rest. Um, every table's different, and every player's different. Um, which is why you know I say if you have the opportunity to play with as many different people as you can. Mm -hmm. So we've picked a class. We've made a note of all the class abilities, right. which for a wizard is going to also entail and other casters spells. So I think for spells, I, I would I, you know b before I get into like the nitty gritty of spell uh, selection and how I how I make those choices. A lot of times when new players start join and join the game, they are told to play simple characters while they learn to play the game. Yeah. They're told, don't, you know, stay away from spell casters uh, because spells are complicated. Stay away from certain character types because they're complicated. I find that l let the new player determine how complex they want their character to be. Yeah. My first D&D character was a fighter magic user thief <laughs> uh, in second edition. That was rules for being a multi-classed elf. Um, having to figure out the way that hit points and everything worked in that edition with a yeah. multi-class character was, was quite uh, complicated. I think looking back on it, it forced me to learn all the rules straight on initially. And, and, and there was, so there was nothing, by the time I was ready to make my second or third character, I didn't feel like there was anything that was off limits or that I couldn't do. Right. And so if you're willing to put in a little bit of extra work, particularly if you're a new player who's gone all in, you've bought a player's handbook, you've got the dice, you've got a group that's, that's there, you're not just testing it out, you, you know that Dungeons and Dragons is your next thing, why not play a spellcaster? Mm -hmm. They are some of the most, most fun characters there because they, they have a lot of options and the spells are like cheat codes to the game and yeah. you get to, to break the rules with spellcasting. Um, and so I, I would recommend if it's something that interests you, try it out. Don't feel like that you have to listen to people who will say, play something simple. You should always play something that seems interesting yeah. uh, is, is, is what you should go with. So I, so I got my wizard needs to pick spells. Yeah. Um, and so for a first level wizard, I'm gonna assume he's got like sort of a, a you know, a 16 is intelligence. Um, that's gonna give him six spells to choose in the very beginning. And so for my wizard and spell book, I'm, I'm probably gonna pick uh, an attack cantrip Mm -hmm. um, more than likely Firebolt, just because it does the most damage. Um, but if I'm feeling like I want to un harass and annoy uh, the enemy, I might pick a cantrip that has like a side effect, like slowing them down through a ray of frost right. or something like that. Um, I like prestidigitation, breast, prestidigit prestidigitation, prestidigitation as uh, another cantrip because it's very versatile. Yeah. Uh, you can perform a lot of magical effects with it. Um, and if you have a cool DM, they will let you get away with more than just what the spell describes. Um, just so that you can do little minor tricks and things. I imagine this character wowing the peasants with his prestidigitation uh, effects. Mm -hmm. um, and then my third cantrip is either going to be Mage Hand for a little bit of minor telekinesis or Message for being able to communicate with party members at a distance. Yeah, D&D text messaging. Really, it depends on what the other cl character classes are like, what my cantrips will be. If there's another arcane caster who who has, uh, you know, I don't like doubling up on non-attack cantrips. Um, so I will, I will select other cantrips if say there's another wizard or a sorcerer or a warlock or something that, that picks similar ones. Uh, that's just me though. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to spells, I'm gonna make sure that I have at least two rituals, probably detect magic and comprehend languages. Um, and then uh, two defensive spells, in this case, probably mage armor and shield, but maybe protection from evil and shield. Mm -hmm. Um, and then two general purpose uh, or offensive spells. Yeah. So maybe Chromatic Orb, maybe Sleep. Um, but I have made wi first level wizards that had no attack magic and it was all utility. And I just relied on spamming my attack cantrip yeah. in combat or performing the help action. 
Um, yeah, I, yeah. My, I had a diviner. His only attack was the was vicious mockery. <laughs> right, and you can get like so with the first level wizard, you can get a familiar, and you can get a flying familiar, and so from first level, you have a flying creature that can grant the help action. Yeah. to just about anybody. And so do you have a ranged character in the party? Then fly that owl out to, to out to his target and and have that owl provide uh, you know grant the help action to that archer. Yeah. Um, that probably that's another strong contender for a first level wizard spell. So when, you know when I'm looking at the spells I, I mentally break them down into obviously defensive magic, offensive magic which includes both damaging as well as providing some sort of negative condition for the enemy to have to deal with. Um, and then utility magic. I play a wizard because I like utility magic. Mm -hmm. I like the versatility of it. And so I will probably pick more utility type spells than I will uh, defensive or offensive. But starting out, I want a nice balance. Right. As I level up, I'll probably tend to favor utility magic over other kinds of magic. Um, and so that's spell selection. I mean, if you're talking a, a cleric or a druid, um, people are going to expect you to heal. If you if you pick one of those classes, and yeah. so while you don't have to be 100% dedicated to healing, you should you know in your daily selection of spells just make sure you have a healing spell ready. Yeah. Uh, you know you you shouldn't feel pressured. Like I said, you shouldn't feel pressured to only cast healing magic, but that's sort of what those classes contribute. Same goes with bard. Yeah. The bards have a limited number of spells known, and you might not want to pick a healing spell for that. Well, yeah, and, and I would say probably the, the same for if you're an arcane caster with something along the lines of like a detect magic or right. any kind of like, once you get higher levels to spell, things like that. Yeah. If you're the arcane guy and you don't do the things that affect arcane spells. Yeah. Yeah, and so there are some spells that, that affect the entire party. Um, you know, a counter spell is a good one for that. You know, an arcane caster with counter spell is protecting not only their magic and their, their allies, but also everyone else in the party. Mm -hmm. They can save that reaction uh, to shut down an enemy spellcaster. They can uh, you know, make sure that the healing spell that really needs to get off doesn't get countered. Right. Um, those are the kinds of things that, uh, that you can do. Um, so I don't know, I mean, it's a very long-winded way, I, th way of, I think of saying that if you feel like spellcasters are interesting, and there are a lot of them yeah. in fifth edition, most classes have some spell option. Right, right. Um, you know, and if you don't feel like going full caster, then there's half casters and, and, and quarter casters in the form of Eldritch Knights, Arcane Tricksters, uh, mm -hmm. Rangers, Paladins, um, that offer some limited spell casting if you just want to try it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so continuing on with uh, with finishing creating your character. Yeah. Uh, tan spell tangent aside. Spell tangent aside. Um, I guess now's a good time to say we do have individual videos over all the classes where we go into a lot more detail. <laughs> a lot more detail. In, in terms of both concepts and, and putting them uh, into practice making a character. So feel free to check those out. Exactly. But um, now that you've gotten you know, you've picked your race and your class and your background. You've, you've written down your hit points. You know, it's yep. max at first level. Uh -huh. You got your your save proficiencies written in. Your ability mods are written in. You you picked You're your skills. Yeah. Um, but you still have to pick uh, equipment. You still got equipment. And 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 I do like how in fifth edition they do have like the pre. The sort of the packages. The packages. Select this off. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, those are for for those classes. That's the general. Uh huh. You know. You're not beholden to that, though. You don't have to, although I do think, uh, it, you know, that if you choose to just roll gold, roll gold, and uh, and go that way, you're not going to be able to afford everything that you would get if you selected the pre-existing pre exactly. packages. I, I'm pretty, as a DM, I'm pretty loose with what starting equipment is. And if yeah. there's an option on there that's like, I don't like this, or I wish I had an... Yeah. Extra martial weapon as can, opposed can to I get, simple. Yeah, can I get can I get this instead of that? And they're comparably priced. You're right. like, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, but I also, you know, there are some versions of D and D where pouring over an equipment list and and getting the most out of the gold that you that you roll at first level is part of the game. And fifth edition yeah. does not seem to be that kind of game. Fifth edition is like, give me the standard package. I've got an adventuring pack on my back. I've got a weapon. I've got the armor. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it's more about what your character can do innately through their class abilities and spells yeah. and getting straight to the action necessarily than, than pouring over that, uh, mm -hmm. pouring over an equipment list. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I've made a fifth edition character that didn't just use the 
base. Oh no, I've, I've, options. I've, yeah, I've always used them. Yeah, so it, um, it makes it quick. We talked about picking backgrounds and how it can give you uh, skills. Yes, maybe a language uh -huh. it gives you like an extra like they call them ribbon abilities. Yes, the ribbon ability. The 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 you know they don't tend to have a lot of mechanical effects, but they yeah. might have sort of or like combat. But you know, yeah. like, like say uh, Outlander, you can. You have a, a, a memory for places you've been. Places you've been. Yeah. You, uh, you can like, what, forage in the wild. And you can for forage for up to like six people. Right. For Standard free. For adventuring party. When normally that's a roll in the game. It's right? roll and slows you down. And uh, it slows you down. In terms of your travel times. Uh, yeah, so th those kind of ribbon abilities are part of the background. But then the backgrounds also give you uh, the biff, your biffs, yeah. your beliefs, your ideals, and your flaws, which to me are one of the more interesting developments uh, of fifth edition. and. Uh, viewers will forgive me if they were in, if those things were introduced in fourth edition, and I'm just oblivious to it. Uh, but to me, they're one of the things about fifth edition that I really like. And if anything, yeah. I wish that there were more options for them. I would like to see a book that expanded and had maybe some generic beliefs, ideals, and flaws, like a d hundred table for each one that you could then roll, or you could go to the ones that are in the background. But new players will forgive me for uh, for digressing on the point. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> yes, mm, yes. I said, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do, I do enjoy biffs. Mm. Biffs. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> oh, <God>. Anyway. <laughs> These are personality traits that you're either selecting or rolling for right. in your character, and they are tied to a game mechanic. When you role play according to one of these beliefs, ideals, or flaws, you're supposed to get inspiration. Yeah. Uh, that's the way inspiration I, is sort of default works. Yeah. And the DM is supposed to, supposed to be familiar enough with them. But uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of tables don't use inspiration, so don't be surprised if you're at one of those tables that don't use it. Yeah, um, but we, they, we forget all the time. I, we forget, I, yeah, all the time. Um, some players just don't, some tables just don't like it whatsoever, um, act, actively dislike it. So what I use the a player's beliefs, ideals, and flaws for is for creating parts of the story that I, as they sort of come up and so linking them into character motivations. So if there's a certain flaw that a, uh, that a player has chosen for their character, then I might, through the course of, of, of a campaign, have an enemy that tries to target that flaw mm -hmm. and, and, and hit them in a, in a weak spot in that way and then leave it open to the character how they, or leave it open to the player how they respond to that. Right. So if you provide those elements of your character to your DM, then they're better able to tailor uh, their campaign to your specific character, and that's yeah. sort of where the beauty of this whole thing lies. Yeah. And that's why you're playing this game rather than, than you know playing a video game or playing a board game or doing something else, is, is you're playing this game because it is a, is a ever-evolving living thing right. that happens when a bunch of people sit down at the table and, and role play together and you have a DM who, uh, who takes all the input from everybody and sort of crafts it into a whole, that's sort of an ideal scenario. There's a lot of ways in which that can go off the rails. <laughs> Well, uh, but yeah. ideally, that's what's happening. Uh, Here's our show on fashion. railroading versus homebrew. <laughs> um, no, sorry. Uh, but yes, when you when you when everything coalesces and it becomes a true group storytelling uh, session. Yeah. I mean, you can tell it. Like we've had plenty of those over the years. Yeah. And it's it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, and it, it it's it, it's a thing that happens. Um, it, it's hard to plan for. It usually happens uh, as sort of an accident of play, uh, but there are certain things that the, both the players and the DMs can do to ensure that when they sit down to play together, that they come together as a nice, cohesive whole. You know, one of my favorite uh, old school D&D bloggers uh, um, sort of has a, a, calls them quarterbacks in D&D, and they are players who when you, when the DM passes them the ball, they know what to do with it. Yeah. When the DM presents a hook, they're ready. Yeah. When the DM says, here's the adventure, this is what I've got ready, this is what I've got prepared, those players are game. Um, and they're ready for, for what's, what's gonna, you know, whatever's gonna happen. They don't need to be told, oh yeah, well, you, you know, you gotta go assault the wizard's castle. Um, and, and then, you know, they don't say, well, how much is it? What's in it for me? Why would I do that? They're like, okay, let's do it. Yeah. Um, and so having that kind of say yes attitude towards gaming, towards the adventure, is is a I think is a uh, an engaging way to play the game. That doesn't mean that you always that that, that when you um, you know that if you're presented with something that you think sounds boring or uninteresting, 
uh, that you you know you always go with it just to be a good sport and you never say anything. But it does mean that you generally try to work with the DM to make sure that a game happens. Right. And you don't go, you know, you didn't, you didn't show up to someone's house or, or your favorite game store and buy all this stuff just to not play, right? Um, so that kind, of atti- uh, that kind of attitude sometimes happens. Um, I would just say, you know, keep an open mind, yeah. engage with the adventure. Find something that you like about every other character at the table yeah. and buy into that. Because what you're doing then is you're telling another player, hey, I hear what you're saying, I hear what your what description about your character, I hear the things that you think are important about your character, and I'm gonna make sure that that gets brought up. And so this shared imagination thing that happens when a game is played gets reinforced when the players engage each other. And they're like, oh yeah, you mentioned this part of your background. Uh, you know, I've, I've got something similar in my background that has it, or, yeah. You uh, you know you mentioned this thing that happened to your character at one time. Tell me more about that. Uh, you know just to kind of engage in it. And what you'll find is that those moments easily slip into in character role playing. Yeah. And that you can easily and 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 as many times as a DM when I've looked up from doing something and the players are engaged in role playing without me at all, mm-hmm. and and I was off in my own little world. Um, and the players are just there, they're maybe speaking in character, maybe not, but they're discussing their characters and, and, and the campaign, and it's a real, uh, it's really, really awesome thing when it happens. Oh, I, I, I completely agree. Um, so, um, other than that, um, I guess it would be worth mentioning only because of human variant. Okay, yeah. It's about the only thing, only time you'd be able to pick a feat. Yes, at first it's level a very, it's a very character humans, creation. Yeah, so right? loop, looping back to races for a second, yeah. um, there is a, a variant of human where instead of the plus one to all stats, you get uh, a, a feat, a language, and a you get a, skill. You get a skill, a feat, and a plus one to two stats. Plus one to two stats, yeah. And it's variant human. If you go online, you wouldn't think it was variant. You would no, assume no, it was the default option for Oh, humans. it is. And it's, <laughs> why aren't you just playing that for every character? Right. You know. Um, but it, it does provide you an opportunity if, uh, if your table is playing with feats to get a feat from first level. Yeah. If that happens, this is definitely a case in your new player that you might just ask the DM, hey, what feat do you think would be good for me to take at this level? Mm-hmm. Or, or is it okay if I don't pick a feat yet, play my character for a couple of levels, then pick the feet. As if you've been developing as it. As if I've been developing it. As you know, because you let's say this. Let's say that you do take the, the advice of playing the champion fighter straight out of the gate. You think it appeals to you mm-hmm. or the party doesn't have a big bruiser and you want to help out. Yeah. Um, and you realize early on that you know, you would rather have the protection afforded by a sword and, and a, or a shield and a hand weapon, a one-handed weapon, as opposed to a double-handed weapon that you were advised to take. Right. Um, you know, if you'd selected Great Weapon Master as that first feat, the, you might want to switch that up to, to something else, Heavy Armor Master or something. Mm-hmm. Ask the DM, is it okay if I try out the character a little bit, see what the campaign's going to be like, and then after a couple of levels, just say, hey, I've been working on developing this feat. Right. Uh, and then go ahead and take it uh, if you are uh, if you do get that feat from human. After this, you pretty much have your character made. After this, you pretty much have your character made. You're ready for your first adventure. Um, right. Relax. It's okay. Everybody feels foolish sometimes when they role play, no matter mm-hmm. how long they've been doing it. Uh, if you feel shy or that you don't want to speak up or you don't want to look like an idiot because you don't know what the dice are, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, it's going to happen. And uh, hopefully you don't play with a bunch of people that give you a hard time about it. <laughs> right. Well, at <laughs> least till like the third or fourth session. Right. At least till then. And then it's all gloves are off. Yeah. Um, after you guys, after you can cast third level spells. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, the, the beauty about the way that the levels progress in Dungeons and & Dragons, and, and the reason why I, I like class and level systems, of, of like Dungeons and & Dragons, is because it gradually eases you into this idea of playing, so that by the time you've gotten a character from first to say, even like 12th or 13th level, you're not a new player anymore. No. Oh. Uh, if you, particularly if you've been playing and, and you've been getting experience points, or, or you know, you, you know, you've been grinding out those levels, maybe you've been playing for half a year or so. Th- I mean, at, at that point, you might still have a lot to learn about the game. There might be a lot of concepts you haven't tried yet. You don't mm-hmm. have as much time under your belt. But by then, you're like a veteran player, so right. it doesn't take that long to master the basics of the game. Not at all. 
Um, but, you know, at the same time, you could play for however many years and still never exhaust all the characters you want to play. Oh, no. I mean, <laughs> you know. Ne- uh, never. <laughs> part of the reason why we keep playing. Well, yeah. I mean, there's always another campaign right around <laughs> the bend. There's always another campaign. Uh, uh, and maybe you like it so much that you want to try your hand at DMing, and then you... Uh, and you can and check out our videos on DMing. Check them out. Um, and, uh, and that's when you're doing uh, the God's work there. Yeah. Is when you make the switch from player to DM. Is that, is that all we got? Yeah. Well. Um, I, well, someone wanted us to talk about unoptimized characters, but we kind of did in just the fact that it's like, you can't really... No, we mentioned that, yeah. You can't, yeah. I mean, deliberately unoptimized characters are one of those things where it's like... Are I mean, you, I, I, like, is, are, are you doing are you, this for attention? Yeah, are you are you, are you like, making a wizard and literally putting your eight in intelligence? I don't know. If I mean, so, then just fuck off. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> just okay. I want to make the word. I want to. I want to make wizard. like. I want to make. Hmm. You could. I want to make Garrett from so, Community. So like God spilled a person. So, but if.